Welcome to the UCANR series on drought irrigation management. Uh, today we're going to be talking specifically about irrigation monitoring and maximum efficiency at the field level. To frame the context of this conversation, we have to think about what, what is a critical process that keeps a crop going. That is basically optimal photosynthesis and maximum carbon dioxide uptake. And where this happens is right here. This is a micrograph of the underside of a leaf where you can see the fully expanded stomata under good turner pressure. Good turner pressure in a plant means that you've got pretty good water status, non-stress conditions. So what happens? Those stomates are where carbon dioxide is absorbed from the atmosphere and where water vapor leaves under transpiration. So when you stress a plant, you decrease the amount of water loss, but you also decrease the amount of carbon dioxide that you take up. If you're after vegetative growth in a plant, like uh, alfalfa, for example, or you're growing carrots or onions, then you're gonna decrease the total yield because you're decreasing the CO2 assimilation. So that being the case, you have to ask yourself, all right, what's essential for maximum irrigation efficiency optimal water balance under drought conditions. Well, I guess you could say, <laughs> you could start on your hands and knees and start with a prayer in the morning because we just don't have enough water for this particular year for almost any place in California. Next step, get all the information you can. That's why you're here watching this video today. And step three, you're gonna get down on your knees. You may be doing that with step one, but you're gonna get down on your knees in the field so you can check the soil profile, emitter flow rates, adjust pressure regulators, and optimize the uniformity of your irrigation system. This essentially is a three-point sermon, uh, three to four if we, in, in reality, talking about salt as well. But today, we've only got time to talk about the first two, understanding water holding capacity and monitoring soil moisture and irrigation uniformity impacts on yield. Rick Snyder has another video in this series where he talks about SIMIS and estimated crop water requirements. So the first step is get to know your dirt. You get out there with your shovel, backhoe is better, understand the layers that you have in a particular soil environment, caliche layers, confining layers that may restrict root development, excessively, uh, excessively silty layers versus sandier layers with a little better uh, aeration that might encourage more roots. And the reason you need to understand that is so that you know how to time your irrigations, the placement of fertilizer, and the water holding capacity of that particular field. So uh, when you're doing that exercise, you got to put some of that dirt in your hands with some water, make a soil ribbon, and we have other materials that talk about how to estimate the soil texture based on the length of that ribbon. Simply said, your available water holding capacity for finer textured soils that do make a ribbon is about equal to the inch length of that ribbon. So if I can make a two inch ribbon, I've got about two inches per foot of soil of available water. And the reason you need to understand that is, okay, I've got mature almonds here, I've got good profile down to six foot. I've got a six foot uh, root zone on, on those almonds. So just how big is my cup? I've got that clay loam soil with a two inch water holding capacity. You add that up, I've got 12 inches of available water and six feet. Or if you have a moderately fine grained sandy loam, you may have seven inches And in this particular example. Uh, and uh, um, you look at your total ET over a period of time, and you say, ah, if I got an average 3 tenths ET, a, in, 3 tenths of an inch ET every day, 2.1 inches, that's uh, seven days reserve I have, by going down to about uh, 50 to 60% depletion. A depletion beyond that level will increase stress and cause a reduction in the amount of uh, CO2 uptake and, of course, ET from the plant. 
So essential, just the basics, right? How about flood irrigation with eight inch alfalfa valves at 200 GPM? Can I be optimal in terms of my irrigation water use efficiency? What about a Delhi Lomi Sand in Stanislaus County where I've got an 18 inch alfalfa valve and I'm flowing on 2,000 gallon per minute over that orchard. Can I be optimal water use efficiency in that scenario? Yeah, that's going to be a toughie. Um, and it's based on this little characteristic right here, understanding what your infiltration rate is, not only for a given field, a given soil, but over time. Row crops, it's very challenging because you start out the season, as you can see here, with a very high infiltration rate uh, because the soil is loose and fluffy after ripping and planting. Next irrigation, you're down to where you're less than half the infiltration by July on this particular soil because this soil has a very bad sealing characteristic. You are less than half of uh, what your infiltration was in July. Gypsum helps to regain some of that structure. But there are certain soils under flood irrigation which this kind of characteristic can actually help you be very efficient. So you put all that together, you say, that's a lot to keep in, try to keep track of. I don't think I can do it. I need a microsystem for maximum efficiency, right? Well, a microsystem can certainly help. Do you need this kind of uh, fancy a, a system where you also have a, a multitude of different fertilizer injection you can do along with the sand media filtration to uh, um, affect the appropriate level of uh, water quality that you need to not clog up your emitters. Uh, is that the key to being 90, 95% efficient with your water use? Uh, for most growers, that does make a difference. It's easier to manage than the variability of flood irrigation. What about technology, monitoring? Do I need uh, these site-specific capacitance probed? plugged into the internet to give me an hourly water content. How about weekly water content measurements with a neutron probe? Is that sufficient to tell me where I'm at? Do I need in-orchard weather data so I can calculate my evapotranspiration right from that particular orchard or field site? How about pressure bomb readings to measure plant stress? Do I need all of that to be of maximum efficiency? And that's the answer. Yes, no, depends. Obviously, it depends on the individual field. So am I sitting here telling you you're going to have to be scientific about your irrigation and scheduling? Well, in a way, yes. But it depends on how you define scientific. I'm not talking about ivory tower lecturing behind your desk. I'm talking about this definition of science. Pertaining to science, that's a systematic knowledge of the physical or material world gained through observation and experimentation. That's a scientist. And in my book, that's a farmer too, who pays attention to what he sees out in the field. That allows you to then understand your soil water characteristics, the interaction of that with your particular crop characteristics, the architecture of the canopy, um, rooting development, time sequence and uh, of, of, of how that crop develops over the one season or over many years as with a permanent crop and then the technology we have to be able to integrate all those factors. Schematically it looks like this. You have the proposed crop on the top, you have the natural factors over on the left hand side here, that's the soil water quality and chemistry, the salts that are there, the structure of that profile. That's just what God gave you, and that's what you got to use. And now here's the technological factors at your disposal. Irrigation system design, chemistry, fertility, pressure management of that field. And we're going to be talking a good bit about those in the next few slides. Okay, so I made the decision to go to micro-irrigation. How do I calculate total available water with micro-sprinklers that are, say, engineered to put on 1.5 inches per day? Now that's 1.5 inches per day over the entire floor of the orchard, but wait a minute, I'm only wetting out to here. I've only got surface wetting of maybe 50 to 60 percent. 
What does that mean for my lower profile? Uh, here's, here's the application pattern from a fan jet. You get little spikes and high points out there that are as much as eight inches in a 24 hour period and little low points that may only be as little as one inch. But when you apply that to the soil, which acts as a sponge, you get this benefit of subbing throughout the root, uh, root zone. And this is actually the total sun water content from the surface down to six foot depth. And here is your active zone right here. You're anywhere from 13 to 16 inches of total water down to a depth of six feet. About half of that's available, about eight, eight to 10 inches. And then here's the area where out towards the middle of the drive where you're not subbing water out to. So what that tells you is, ah, I've got 50 to 60% of the volume of my total root zone. So if I'm 50%, my one and a half inch application is actually a three inch application in that wetted zone. What about drip irrigation? This is a double line drip system in that same almond orchard that we had the fan jets. Now you look at this and you go, oh, wait a second, look, I've just got those tiny little divots right along here. Does that mean I just have a trash can size of wetting under each of those emitters? Well, in the top six inches, yeah, that's true. But the subbing on this fine grain soil is so beautiful that you end up with this inverted mushroom at a depth of about two foot below the profile, uh, one and a half to two foot, that gives you essentially the same water storage area that you had under that fan jet. So again, you've got about 50% volumetric um, water storage in that soil. So a one and a half inch per day application engineering wise in the system becomes a three inch application in the wetted zone. On most of our loamy soils, that's not a problem to handle, but if you get into some soils that are coarse sandy loam to loamy sand, the available soil moisture drops down to an inch or less per foot. The ability of that water to sub across that soil profile also drops tremendously. So if you're on a coarse loamy sand and you can only sub three or four foot in diameter compared to a sandy clay, sandy clay loam, where you can sub seven or eight foot in diameter, which was the case on that drip field we just looked at, you have a vastly different amount of days of non-stress moisture reserve in that field. You can go up to eight days in that sandy clay loam, or uh, sandy clay, I'm sorry, four to six days, compared to only one or two days in that coarse loamy sand, or coarse sandy loam. Uh, and the same, by the same token, it takes fewer hours to refill that depth of profile. The bottom line is, if you want to be efficient with your irrigation schedule, an occasional 48-hour set in these finer grain soils is not a bad idea to help recharge completely down through the profile. But if you've got this loamy sand, sandy loam, you're just blowing water through the root zone if you run a 48-hour set. Uh, um, so how do I know when I'm doing that or not doing that? I, I, I've dug backhoe pits in that field and I kind of do know this soil moisture feel thing, but, but I, I can't dig pits all day long out there. So I have to have some way to help me understand where is that water going. That's why we do soil moisture monitoring and, of course, evaluate our irrigation uniformity out on that field. So we're going to talk about irrigation. Uh, well, the big deal about soil moisture, plant stress, every field is different. You saw those infiltration curves. Uh, earlier on in the presentation. So I need something in a particular field to tell me what's going on. First off, we're gonna talk about irrigation uniformity. You look at this uh, alfalfa field here, which has problems with salt buildup due to insufficient water out on the tail end,
compared to these very uniform looking almond orchards on micro sprinkler that are around it. The biggest thing you can do in this drought year is to improve your irrigation uniformity to help try and eliminate these excessively dry areas. In tree crops, it looks like, like this. Here is a drip system where the grower wasn't paying attention to this particular area and he had uh, some surface sealing problems. The trees ponded up and they got Phytophthora and he lost a good number of trees in this overly wet part of the orchard. In a, a flood system, this is how we classically describe distribution uniformity. Distribution uniformity is simply uh, 100 to get your percent times the low quarter average infiltration, that would be right about here, divided by the average of the infiltration for the entire block. And you come up, you come up with a percent uniformity. If this was even infiltration all the way across here, it would be 100%. In this case, this particular drawing shows about a 70% DU. This is what it looks like in a flood almond field. Here's the tail end where there was insufficient penetration over several years. They accumulated salts. They defoliated the Monterey. The mites came in like crazy on both the Monterey and the nonpareil trees. And here's what the head end looks like. Absolutely no problem, no defoliation because the head end had sufficient recharge of water. In a drip system, here's how you evaluate your uniformity. You have to go to individual water, individual emitters, get down on your hands and knees and use some kind of measuring cup or I use a milk jug put on a fan jet to catch the amount of water. Measure it over time. You do that out across the entire orchard. You also make note of where you have these host screens that get plugged up with algae and other kinds of garbage. Uh, those screens are there to protect your emitters if you get a break in the pipe. That happens sometimes, like happened right up here. But if you don't pay attention to your sanitation, this can really drop pressure in those hoses and give you bad uniformity over time. Uh, the other problem is your chemistry. You got high bicarbonate in the water uh, and you're injecting calcium uh, gypsum to try and improve infiltration. You can precipitate lime and end up clogging some of those emitters. Uh, the other problem with uniformity issues is topography. If you don't have a system that's designed with pressure compensating emitters and you have this kind of rolling hills, you're gonna get less water up there, you're gonna get a lot more water in the low areas, and you're gonna end up with poor uniformity and poor yield on those other trees up on the top. Here's what it looks like in most uh, uh, common orchards in California right now that have some kind of micro sprinkler system. Either you'll have an automatic pressure regulator uh, with a pilot that you can set to particular pressure, or people put in just these manual regulation valves. They put the little Schrader valves on there so you can put a, a pressure gauge on top of there and you adjust the gate valve to get your 20, 25 pounds, whatever you want on the hose. The automatic pilots here are supposed to keep that 20 to 25 pounds, whether the filter station's back flushing or uh, not back flushing and allow for differences maybe in power level um, on the grid so that you can keep exactly that amount of pressure. But the problem is automatic regulators are sometimes way too ignored and they fill up with silt and crap and you'll end up uh, either getting higher pressure than you want, lower pressure than you want. And in a field setting, it can end up looking like this. You, you, the go, between the gophers and the rats and the mice, you fill up these boxes. And this one particular orchard I was in, uh, some of these boxes had not been cleared out for years. The consequence of that is exhibited by this particular slide. A little hard to see on this display, but if you look over on this side, you've got a lot greener foliage and denser trees. They're a little lighter on this side. The bottom line 
is the distribution uniformity in this field was about 75%, not too bad, but in these low application areas, I was only getting 45 and a half inches on these almonds over the season compared to 58 inches and 54 inches of irrigation in this side of the block that had better pressure. Um, the, the final result in this particular field looked like this. This side over on the southeast, sorry, southwest compared to this side on the southeast was 50 inches versus 58 inches. Uh, these are stem water potential measurements showing stress over July going into August at the critical time where we're doing the final expansion of the nut and getting into hole split. And you can see we had significantly more stress on this side, uh, sorry, this side over here where we have lower stem water potentials then less stress up here. The bottom line was reduced nut size on this particular orchard. Schematically, it looks like this. If you look on the, on the left-hand side, you can see a distribution uniformity of 90%. The right-hand side shows a distribution uniformity of 70%. When I took Irrigation 101 30 some odd years ago, people said 70% uniformity in agriculture, that is really good. But that's not good any longer, especially when we're to the point where we have uh, $500 and $1,000 an acre foot water on the west side in this particular drought year. Because what it boils down to is on a 70% uniformity, the dry quarter of the field gets seven tenths of an inch if my target application is one inch, say, per 24 hours. That's typical of a lot of double line drip systems. In the wet part of that orchard, I get twice the amount of water, 1.42 inches. Because remember, it's the dry quarter divided by the average of one inch. That's what gives me the 70%. But 25% of my orchards too wet, and the other 25% is way too dry. At a 90% DU, I've got 9 tenths in the dry quarter average, 1.1 inch on the wet average. Much better uniformity. And that translates into much more uniform development of the trees, much more uniform yield eventually. We'll conclude in a moment with some uh, 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 talk on, on some of those uh, yield, apparently yield losses for different water applications. Uh, evaporative losses are a big problem with young orchards. This is where you might want to consider a double line drip system or little hats that go on top of the fan jets to direct the sp spray down. So how can I figure out if I'm optimizing that water balance or not? How can I look down into the dirt and make that happen? That's where we get into technology. Augering, um, and every single one of my growers, I never make a farm call to them unless they've gone out and augered the field beforehand. Uh, they know that now, and they've also profited by that. Uh, you need an auger if you're going to get down to five or six feet. Uh, an easier way to do it is push probes. Uh, you can get a quick push on what your water content is down to a couple, three foot that way. Um, there's a whole variety of different styles of auger, depending on whether you're sand or clay. Tensiometers are an in situ uh, instrument that tell you the soil matrix potential. Uh, a typical setup would be something like this. You pound a hole in the soil, you wet it down, you set that tip, and you read the moisture tension over time. Those are manual readings. A watermark block is an electrical resistance block. That can be hooked up to a variety of different loggers, as can these kind of sensors. We've got dielectric sensors, TDR sensors. It gets to be really confusing. Capacitance probe sensors, PureSense, is a, uh, PureSense farm systems, John Deere Water has their own version now. There's no end to these devices. You can transmit the signals out of uh, a cell phone uh, uplink, DSM modem, get the information back on your computer at home. Uh, that has a subscription fee. There are also infield loggers 
where you can download them to a computer, get a, get a single number of current conditions, or this AM400 Hansen logger gives you a little picture right in the field. Um, <clears throat> Where do I monitor? Where do I put those things? Obviously, you can see by the difference in water content by the application to put a soil moisture sensor out here, that's not going to tell you what you want to know. But should I have it here, this close to the tree? Or should I have it out here? Should I have it right here? Uh, you're going to have to do some probing and digging yourself to figure out where the roots are set. Do I need more than one type of sensor? Do I need the aerometer, uh, tensiometer here? Do I need neutron probes? Do I need capacitance probes? Uh, I can tell you right now that as long as you've chosen the right spot, you pay attention to a good quality installation, virtually any of those instruments will give you a good information. Uh, now, we'll go through a quick example of soil moisture monitoring in citrus where there was also a uniformity problem. This is using an infield logger with these watermark sensors. Uh, they were set up at a, dis, uh, at a depth of 18 and 36 inches um, and uh, plugged into this uh, Hansen logger here. Uh, and, and I'll just spend a bit of time talking about these particular patterns. If you look at this particular graph, we have the 18 inch with a very sharp peak, which is water wetting that uh, profile very quickly, and then it drains through the 18 inch and goes down to the 36 inch. But look at what happens with the 36 inch. I'm going from about 10 to 20, um, uh, 10 to 20 centibars, uh, 10 down to 30 centibars here each time. And when I re-wet the profile with the irrigation, my water content come refills, down to about 10 or 8 centibars, and it stays right there. And then the tree uses that. What does that tell me? That tells me that I've stuck basically every bit of water in that root zone. Contrast that with this particular picture. Um, up on the, up on the uh, top, uh, up on the top uh, uh, graph here, compared to the lower graph, the, this is actually the same row in an orchard. This row, this, this particular section was in the lower part. Uh, we had a little bit of a slope coming down. This particular uh, uh, monitoring site was in the upper part of the profile. And again, you can see the sharp peak at 18 inch. We have the perfect rewetting at 30 inch, I'm sorry, yeah, at, 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 at 30 inch, these are 15 and 30 inches in this case. Uh, and if you notice, we were waiting until the, the total tree water content drop went down to about 50 centibars at that 15 inch uh, uh, watermark monitor in this case. In the upper area where we had a higher pressure so these fan jets were putting out about 25% more water than these were. The trees never had a chance to dry out. So they were wet all the time, and, that, uh, and, and the, ir the, the grower used a 24-hour irrigation for these particular tr trees, and uh, you can see he blew water by that 36-inch depth every time. That's wasted water, and in a drought year like this year, we don't have that water to waste. Here's another, uh, another system where the grower just kept the trees completely too wet, never let them dry out with a drip irrigation system. So uh, you can spend $5,000 to $10,000 to get these internet-based systems. You can spend $700 to $800 to get an in-field uh, watermark and uh, logger system. Um, what choice do you make? You're going to have to just figure out how often do you want to be in the field? Are you, is it more convenient to check things on your computer in the morning? Uh, and what level of precision do I want in these graphs? Do I need a graph for every foot from one to four foot uh, to look at how these patterns of refill, 
water use, refill water use go? Um, maybe not. Uh, that level of sophistication may or may not pay you back. How about a neutron probe service? There's a uh, few outfits in the Central Valley that offer neutron probe monitoring. Uh, this device here cannot be automated. They're only going to give you a reading about once a week. It gives the biggest volume of sampling of all of the sensors out there, about a basketball size. So the accuracy can be pretty good. The disadvantage of that, though, is when do you pull that sample? If I'm on kind of a weekly irrigation scenario, and my monitoring of the company I hire, I do it myself as a weekly scenario, here's an example where the blue line is where we did the neutron probe water content. And the neutron probe measurements were almost always just before the irrigation. So I never had the chance with a neutron probe to see just how well I refilled my root zone, whether or not that was really, really the case. So timing issues uh, on a very fine grained soil, not as critical. If you're going to go to where you're uh, uh, doing a deficit irrigation and you know you're not going to get water past two feet, not a big deal. But the bottom line is you got to use a sharper tool than this one. Um, and we have them out there. Uh, should I use pressure bomb to look at water stress? Water stress can be useful, but look at these graphs here. There was virtually no difference. This is the plant water stress for a 48 inch application and 56 inch application of water to this almond orchard um, that from 2013. Water content is, is much better here for the 56 inch orchard compared to the 48 inch orchard. There was virtually no difference in what the tree stress looked like until we got right in here into uh, July and August. A little bit of difference there. So it looks like, well, that's not too bad, right? No problem. Uh, the reality is that that 16% less water reduced my yield by 9%. That was a fine grain soil on the west side. On the east side, we did a much more complicated experiment and we were looking at 70, 80, 90, 100, 110% ET, and we had much greater yield decline at the 70 and 80% compared to our 100% loss over here. We lost about six to 800 pounds of nuts to the acre at that 70 and 80% uh, 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 water application. A lot of almond growers this year are going to have to get by with much less water than that. But the bottom, is, bottom line is 20% less water on this coarser sandy soil cost me 15% yield reduction, while, it was, while a 16% less water was only a 9% yield reduction on this finer grain soil. The bottom line is know your dirt, get some equipment, get organized, uh, put all your data from your irrigation, depth application, your pump flow, the types of emitters you have, and some record of how that water content is looking over the season. Whether you're using a canned irrigation program like Ag Water with CIT or Roy or PureSense, or uh, I have a San Joaquin Valley irrigation checkbook scheduler, uh, that information in an organized fashion will tell you where you are and God willing, if you've got a well you can turn on and run a little bit more, then maybe that's what you need to do. Or you can back off some and you don't need to do as much. Um, the website address is up here, so you can uh, uh, get this particular spreadsheet scheduler if you want. Uh, but the bottom line is put your shadow in the field this is the most helpful thing that you can do. Uh, and economically speaking, $60 water, you save six inches, that's only 4,500 bucks over 150 acres. But if you can put on an extra 150 boxes per acre of 
88 size pack out in a citrus orchard, and we've done this with improved irrigation monitoring to recognize water deficient status in that orchard. You pull out a $2 net after pick and pack, you got 45,000 bucks extra for that particular field. So a picture may be worth several thousand dollars. Thanks for listening.